The research we do on Joshua trees out of my office, the Center for Conservation Biology. Uh, we work in Joshua Tree National Park, among other places. So talking about the hotter, drier future and how it will be a, a challenge for species. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Joshua trees and some of the de cool desert species we have out here. So, let's see. all right. This is just a quote I like. I thought it would be good for Arbor Day, uh, the theme. Um, so this is a William Blake quote. So trees, you know, move some to tears of joy. Um, excuse me, uh, tree which moves some to tears of joy in the eyes of others, only a green thing that stands in the way. Um, some see nature all ridicule and deformity, and some scarce see nature at all. But to the eyes of the person of imagination, nature is imagination itself. And I think so too. I think these trees are inspiring to a lot of people, and that's why that's why we love them so much. So this is a beautiful photo from Joshua Tree. So, all right, so Joshua Trees have certainly gotten a lot of media, um, especially last year we had a paper come out um, confirming that we will probably see a range restriction in the Joshua Tree towards end of century, which I'll talk about our research, but certainly it was big news and um, it, was, uh, it was exciting to be part of a conversation, but it was also um, really, um, uh, really, you know, scary to talk about with people. I think a lot of people were really shocked. So, so got a lot of attention. Um, and I just want to talk about how we came to those conclusions. Um, so before we really start, and I apologize, my thing is in the way here, so I will try to read this. Uh, so I want to do a land acknowledgement to acknowledge that we did do this research on um, the ancestral home of several tribes, including a Serrano, a Chemuevi, um, Kuila, Kuia, and uh, Mojave tribes. And today those peoples continue to protect and remain in relationship with these relatives and it's vital to honor these beginnings and recognize the ongoing dedication and importance of the indigenous culture uh, within our communities and the land that we um, gather, live, learn, and work on. So I want to make sure um, we, we respect them this way. So we have... So, so the, you know, this is the desert is a, is a lovely place for a lot of people oops, to, um, to recreate. Um, it's a place, you know, hikers, bikers, climbers, probably some of you have climbed in Joshua Tree, art lovers, sightseers, there's a great arts community up there. Um, so it's a really great place for people to gather and look around. It's definitely not an empty place. It's full of wonderful things to see. Um, and uh, we here at the Center for Conservation Biology work on science aimed at managing these wonderful places and making it so we can continue to enjoy them into the future. All right, so where we are here is in a hot spot of biodiversity. Uh, so if you look at the number of species, you know, per square meter, kilometer, uh, you can see a real density of the number of species that occur here in Southern California, and especially in the desert, um, we have topography, so a lot of different elevations and slopes. We have the Mojave Desert coming in, the Sonoran Desert, the coastal influence, and it makes for a real hotspot of biodiversity. If you look at central plains, you know, states, you might think, oh, they're really green, there must be a lot of biodiversity there, but actually, if you think about thousands and thousands of years ago, that was under miles of ice. Uh, there's a huge glacier covering a lot of the U.S., and so that lack of biodiversity is really a relic of that era. So while it's still very green and so forth up there, they actually don't have the number of species we have that were able to persist through the ice age in Southern California. So what kind of ecosystem services do we think about when we uh, are talking about desert species especially? So we have, you know, for instance, flood control, vegetation slows the flow of water, improves absorption, um, let's see, into the ground, we have, uh, let's see, oh, there we go. Climate control, the leaves, of course, some of you study um, environmental science, I'm sure, you know that leaves provide um, a shade, but also transpire water, which causes a, um, the air to cool by that evaporative process, uh, cooling local temperature, so we like trees. Uh, air quality, we have the absorption of carbon dioxide, the release of oxygen, also sort of, you know, so dust control, stopping, uh, stopping dust from blowing through. Um, and of course, pollinators and pest control. We love our bees. Um, those also act to pollinate crops and the diversity of uh, insects and uh, the natural biodiversity helps suppress disease. So we have birds, mammals, and snakes, and all those things contribute to, um, to our um, health as a community. So what I'm talking about today is an area, Joshua Tree National Park uh, in Southern California. Um, so we have, it's at really the intersection of this on the right, which is the Colorado, otherwise known as Sonoran Desert, and the Mojave Desert to the north, and that's all south of the Great Basin Desert. So 
a lot of California's land mass is actually in, in desert. And um, so at uh, the Mojave Desert is the cooler, you know, lower evaporation desert, upper elevation, elevations from three to 6,000 feet. I live in the Mojave Desert, so I'm sitting here in Palm Desert. I can actually see Joshua Tree from my window, and I actually live up there in the Mojave Desert. So I'm in the Sonoran Desert as I sit here. Um, but, you know, some wonderful cactus species, um, a lot of biodiversity, so it's definitely not an empty place. And I want to give a shout out to, to Dr. Fraga at Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, who had produced this graphic originally. Um, fantastic botanist. Um, so we have, you know, perennials and cacti on the left here. That's actually a baby Joshua tree. You can tell if you do go to the park, Joshua trees are the small um, uh, plants that look like this, but also have the black, so they have the black tips and the short, uh, short leaves. So if you see something else that looks similar to that, um, check out if it has a black tip and um, the really short leaves. And on the right is one of my favorite little foxtail cacti, which is really cute. Uh, we also have a beautiful annual wildflower show um, out here, our show of wildflowers. So uh, our rain happens same time as, you know, Riverside. So we have primarily rain in the winter and spring. And then we have a beautiful show of annual wildflowers and then they die back. And then we have some perennial setting um, flowers and seeds and then gets very hot and very dry pretty quick. So, um, but this is just a look at our, our some of our wonderful wildflowers. Um, but then we also have areas that might look more like a woodland or forest. This is pinyon pine habitat, uh, 5,300 feet, Queen Mountain. This is one of our plots. There we are with some volunteers collecting data on pinyon pines. And then we have remarkable plants out in the desert. So this is the king clone creosote bush. So creosote bush is a really um, ubiquitous plant in the Mojave and some of the Sonoran Desert as well. Um, it is a really, really tough plant. Um, and it just, you know, grows way across the landscape um, really commonly. Um, and this plant, so my boss there, Cameron, Cameron Barrows, director of this uh, section here, he is standing in the middle of this ring. So essentially the shrub started out right where he's standing and over time it grew outward. So this is a clone or the same plant that was started growing 11, over 11,000 years ago. And up in the upper right, I took a screenshot from Google Earth so you can see how you can actually see the ring on Google Earth and see how old that is. So we have some really, some really old plants here, which is cool. So really tough, really old plants. On the left, that's me with the desert uh, horned lizard. We have bighorn sheep. We have uh, collared lizards, a uh, diversity of lizards, lizard species as well. So it's home to a lot of animals and plants, certainly not a barren environment. And of course, the star of the day, uh, Joshua tree, Yucca brevifolia. Um, it's an iconic species of the Mojave. People travel here to see it. Uh, grows about 3,000 to 5,500 feet elevation. Um, a lot of the Mojave does not have Joshua trees, but it is a characteristic of Mojave. Um, it's actually an arborescent monocot, and it's in the century plant family. Um, there's the uh, beautiful Jepson drawings that you could find in, in the Jepson manual online if you're interested in plants. Check out plants on there. Um, and so the question is, is it a tree? And it's something, you know, sometimes we just sort of repeat, oh, it's not a real tree. You know, it's not an oak, it's not a pine. Um, but actually, there's no good formal definition of a tree per se. Um, and I'll get to that, but it's a really weird looking um, plant nonetheless. We've got multiple trunks, you know, really weird vasculature in the middle. Um, there's me with some uh, younger volunteers checking out the flower uh, stalk at the top that had fallen off a plant. So, so it's a really neat one. Um, so the US Department of Interior had tweeted about um, these remarkable trees for Arbor Day. And somebody, I won't say who, had called them out saying, Joshua tree is not a tree. So be careful kids, the internet is forever. Um, so they, um, they said, no, it's just a tall pokey plant, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's actually interesting because there's really no basis for that. So, you know, trees have tall trunk, shrubs have several short trunks, but there's some, you know, multi-trunked shrubs or trees that are too tall to be considered shrubs. So, you know, my friend Chris, who um, lives in the uh, Mojave as well and works for Parks Association, he said, you know, there's no canonical definition of tree, then we can just say that it's a tree, essentially. And there's a whole blog. If you want to check out some fun uh, pondering about the desert, check out his Letters from the Desert uh, column online. So check him out. Um, and another fellow chimed in. We had a whole Twitter conversation about it. But, you know, he said, you know what? Ask, ask a four-year-old 
if he or she says it's a tree, that's good enough for me. So there's my little uh, two-year-old designating our backyard Joshua tree a tree. So, so they're very slow growing. Um, that's you know part of why they're so special. You know they they take they take some time to get to uh, a decent height, uh, only about one to two inches per year, and that's a, a lot actually um, on the higher end. Um, they're very slow, conservative of resources. Um, I was talking about the annual plants earlier. Those are plants that you know live fast, <laughs> live fast and die essentially. They use all the resources, set seeds, and die all in one season. These are plants that grow really slowly, invest a lot in structure because they don't want to desiccate and they don't want to be eaten by animals. So, so really slow growing species. Let's see, all right, reproduction. So they can reproduce one of two ways that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so by a seed, generally they have to establish underneath an existing shrub um, for uh, shelter essentially, um, and via clonal growth as well. And these episodes of what we call as ecologists recruitment, it's essentially when you have seeds successfully making it to the seedling stage, sporadic and rare, often tied to like El Nino events or times of increased rainfall. So, so essentially you could go years without having baby J Joshua trees on the landscape and then have a wet year and then they start, you know, recruiting again. So they are a result of a really specialized symbiosis with a, a yucca moth. So again, they can go down the clonal reproduction path and you've probably seen clonal plants in botanic gardens and so forth. There's plants that sucker underneath the ground, produce a rhizome and produce another plant, or maybe you have some in your yard or wherever. Um, and then there's plants that reproduce, you know, by making a flower, getting pollinated and making a seed. Um, and so it, this can do both. So this is a really specialized relationship with a, with one particular moth. So, so it, there's a photo of the moth on the left from the Joshua Tree National Parks Flicker, and that's the center of a Joshua Tree flower there. Um, so they rely on the life cycle of this moth to achieve pollination. So essentially, if there, this moth didn't occur, they would not be able to set seed at all. Um, the females land on the plant, gather pollen into a little ball with their mouth tentacles, um, and the moth then goes in search of another flower um, on a different Joshua tree that doesn't have eggs on it. And the moth you know, pollinates that plant and then lays its eggs in one of five sections in the stigma. So that central portion is the stigma and that has five sections, a lot like, you know, like an orange essentially. Um, and deposits the ball, pollinates the plant, the female produces just enough eggs to make sure the flower will produce fruit, but that the larvae can also survive. So it's a real balance between the two, which is really cool. And then I'll talk about the second part of it. So we have the moth, you have the eggs, and then they, um, then you have the fruit. So we have flowers to fruit. And I actually brought a prop here. Um, See, I'm gonna get my face back here so I can see what you're seeing. Okay, so, so the larvae eat only some of the, essentially the seeds and fruit. And this is a look at a cross section that I grabbed off the back tree in my backyard. It had been hanging around for a while. So you can see how there's sections. And then there is, and actually this one has six, but um, one section that's probably been eaten by a yucca moth. And what it does is it only takes up one section and leaves the rest so that it can still produce seeds and the relationship can continue. So this is this is really cool. Actually, the seeds are really neat. They're like little hockey pucks. I don't know if anyone's a hockey fan, but see, there's little little hockey pucks. They're very very cool. So we're gonna hang around. Actually, we have an entomologist in our group, and we're gonna put it in a plastic bag and see if any moths emerge. We'll see. So so once the moths are um, excuse me, the larvae are fully grown. They basically bury themselves, form cocoons. Um, they remain there and then emerge as moths and then um, again the fruit develops and is dispersed and the cycle repeats. So it's a really specialized process. I just want to give you an appreciation. It's not like a lot of plants that are wind pollinated. This has to have this specific pollinator to survive. So, so you know in terms of the biological community that it supports, it supports the sole pollinator, the yucca moth. Um, the fruit is consumed by antelope ground squirrels, which are really, really adorable little creatures, right? There's one up on the upper right. And all these pictures are either from me or the Joshua Tree National Park Flicker, unless otherwise indicated. Um, so they're eaten by other rodents. And really that's their only dispersal mechanism, which can be a challenge for Joshua trees. 
<laughs> um, lots of species of ants and so forth. Yucca night lizard, which you can find if you have a, you see a downed piece of a Joshua tree and you, um, with the old leaves on it and pick it up and sort of shake it, you can, might be able to see a yucca night lizard underneath it takes a shelter underneath. Um, in birds nest in the tree, you can see some beautiful birds like Scott's Orioles if you hang around Joshua trees long enough, which I recommend. Um, you know, I've seen hawks perch on these. Um, they're just a really important structural part of the ecosystem. And the foliage is uh, food for herbivores, which can be a challenge for the seedlings, jackrabbits in particular. And so in our lab, um, before I came into the lab, they had started a project looking at the vulnerability of all the different, or a lot of different species in the desert. And so here's a list, you probably can't read all of these, but essentially um, the, the species on the upper part of the list are, were ranked most vulnerable to climate change, um, um, very vulnerable and then less vulnerable at the bottom. And so this was uh, basically ranking species according to life history and different aspects of, of of their biology and saying, how vulnerable are you um, if we see a temperature increase? And so Joshua Tree ranks up there highly. Pinion pine is actually probably more vulnerable. Um, and then down in the less vulnerable species would be things like creosote bush. And when we're talking about Joshua trees, we're actually talking probably about two species. Um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, when they declined to list the species as endangered or threatened, they also said, though, there are probably two species, which is interesting because botanists hadn't quite gotten there yet. Um, and so now, you know, I think a lot of people are recognizing that there really are two forms. So there's the Western jo Joshua tree, and these circles are not correct at all. Um, it's just to give you a general idea, Western Joshua tree in California. There are some Eastern Joshua trees in Mojave National Preserve. So right here, those are actually Eastern. Um, and then oh, over here are more Eastern Joshua trees. So go right into Arizona. So those Eastern Joshua trees actually have a different pollinator. And as you can see, they look really different. So likely two species that had been treated as one. Um, and now I think there's more recognition that there's two. So when you're driving to Vegas, for instance, you're seeing mostly this Eastern Joshua tree. And so when uh, there's a new petition to list the tree, I think they're talking about the Western Joshua tree in California. So the tree is a little bit, you know, kind of in trouble. It has, the range has contracted since the Pleistocene. Um, so this was a, a graphic from Coledal 2011. And essentially, you know, this was the old distribution of Joshua trees. You know, they use things like pack rat middens and other uh, evidence to establish where Joshua trees were in the past. And it's really contracted. So it used to be this whole gray hash section. And now the current um, distributions in gray here. So really constricted um, since that um, since that time. And you know even now so the reproduction across the whole range just depends on the density and the health of adults, uh, flower production, pollination by the yucca moth. It's got it's got a lot of um, it's got a little bit of the uh, card stacked against it in some ways um, in terms of its biology. And in terms of you know, climate, so increases in temperature and decreases in rainfall, which what we, is what we have been seeing over the past 60 or so years uh, here, it's uh, documented, um, you know, you could, that would result in less small plants. Um, any changes in the soil moisture, any of you who garden or have plants in your house, you know you need to maintain that soil moisture, um, especially for young plants, they re they're really vulnerable. Um, and for adults, um, any changes in like frost days, um, a lot of people have been looking into what exactly causes the plant to set flower and fruit, and uh, that's still somewhat of a, a question, but they might need something like a frost to do that. So we want to have, keep those frosts, of course. Um, and so essentially reproduction is key to sustainable populations, and that's what we decided to look into. So here is um, on the upper left, Patrick Gonzalez, who is the um, uh, climate change scientist for the National Park Service, essentially. He's also a professor at Berkeley. And uh, he actually came out with us to measure. We were measuring junipers that day, but got to talk to him a lot about Joshua trees. Um, and he's working with the park on, you know, adapting to climate, um, climate change. Um, and so he put out a paper, you know, essentially the arid southwest has already experienced some of the sharpest declines in precipitation in the lower 48. Um, which is pretty scary. Um, so these increases levels, increased levels of aridity, hotter temperatures have been, have been seen in really 1300 years. So, so we're seeing a, a shift already, um, which is 
is troubling. Um, and so just to reiterate, so really we have carbon dioxide at the highest level in 800,000 years. Um, this additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere isotopically matches fossil fuels and not natural sources. Um, the higher CO2 levels physically, this is shown to cause higher temperatures, greenhouse effect. And an analysis of all the causes um, showed that less than 3% could be explained by any other um, factor other than uh, increasing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So, so we can really attribute this to, to our actions, which is something to think about.